particular bike, and the reason I'm talking about it tonight is because it's, it's quite similar to the first two bikes I owned and rode, which were Honda C200s. Pressed steel frame, single cylinder engine bikes. Uh, so I've got a soft spot for them. It's diametrically opposed to what I ride normally, if you know I've got a soft spot. <coughs> and that's, that's the love of my life as far as bikes go, but uh, this is my hobby because this takes me back to my roots. And I want to preserve them. They're starting to go away, and I don't see them around, so I want to see them come up. There's other reasons why I restored it as well. We, uh, we all talk about uh, that find or that bike we've dug up somewhere, and you hear the term barn find. Even though we found it in a garage or some service station or something. Well, this bike literally came from the top floor of a little barn out in Stony Mountain been in storage for 31 years in a very tightly sealed non-ventilated room so when we strip the paint there's little rust traces they look like wormholes all along the metal these all these little red tracks and they've been cats pissing on it for 31 years and, uh, and being a pressed frame bike the entire inside of the frame was a mouse nest and I mean right from the neck all the way down to the motor all the way out to the tailpipe and they'd gotten in there and they'd eaten every last piece of vinyl off the wiring, right down to the center, and managed to even eat about uh, six of the chunks of copper. I don't know why that disappeared, but they ate that as well. Uh, so it was an interesting restoration. The little Hondas are a little bit hard to restore if you need plastic. Headlight buckets, fenders are molded, very hard to get a hold of unless you got a cub. Those are reproed because let's face it, over in Asia, there's probably still 20, 30 million of them running around. Like that. So while, while they look at those parts as replacement parts, we look at them as like restorer's dream, right? But those parts are a little bit hard to find that. Another reason I restored it was, uh, or wanted to talk about it, is it's too bad Greg and Jim aren't here. There's a tie-in to a couple of club members here as well. When I mentioned this to uh, Greg Kendall, I said, hey, Greg, a barn find I found out. Honda C65. Where'd you find it? Stony Mountain. He just freaked. He went, where? Who? Who? Oh, who'd you get it off of? What color is it? And I go, whoa, what's going on, Greg? He says, oh, the, the very first bike I rode was an, owned was an S65. And I sold it to someone in Stony Mountain. About the same time frame that this bike actually showed up in Stony Mountain, only it came from Roland. It went from the uncle to two cousins. They couldn't get it running. Went to the top floor of the barn. That's been its entire life. So I had to explain, no, that's not it. But and he told me that was the first bike he ever owned and rode. So I don't know if anybody noticed this at the rally. We actually got him on the bike and burned around the parking lot for a while <laughs> for a bit of nostalgia. And then we have another new member, Jim. Jim Taves, has he joined you? Yeah. Yep. Yes, yep. he has. He's been here okay. Last Jim's new member. And at our uh, pony crawl on our feature night, Jim showed up and he found this bike in Portage Perry of all places. He shows up with a red one. Now they're not a very common bike, and to see him pull up another one in a trailer, I had to go, whoa, where'd you get this thing? Where do you find this stuff, Jim? Because he's hooked already. He's been a member for, what, two months. He's already got a Honda S90, which is the bigger brother to the S65. Which now we go on a little bit of the history of the bike itself. 1965. It was an important year for Honda because up till then all their bikes were pushrod. Honda never had a two-stroke except for the very first two, two years of their existence. They've always been four-cycle engines. In 1965, though, they come out with an absolute jewel of engineering. That was their overhead cam engines. In 1965, they had motors that were getting one and a half horsepower per cubic inch. If you were fortunate enough to own an SS50, you were getting two horsepower per cubic inch. People aren't getting that out of modern engines. And they were doing that as an 11,500 RPM was the red line on that engine on a single cylinder engine. Uh, just an amazing piece of engineering. If you look closely, the paint's not that good, the chrome's not that good, the polishing and everything else is not really that good, and they ride kind of funny. But the heart of that bike, that little motor, is what really made Honda. And as a bit of an aside, Honda, as far as I've found, did not export a bike until 1959. They did not go outside of Japan. The Cub came along in 58. <clears throat> Honda didn't 
it's boring till 59. But by 1962, they were the largest manufacturer in the world, in three short years. Basically because of an advertising program that just about broke Mr. Honda in 1959, and that was you meet the nicest people on a Honda. Back then, in 1959, 60, that ad program cost him $300,000, which if you extrapolate that today's money is a huge pile of money and a big gamble for him, but it paid off largely. Now here's the dig. <laughs> I said this is coming. Because in the last couple of meetings I've heard some, some back and forth about well, you know, th this type of bike got uh, disqualified from this trial because it was winning too many races. Oh, no. And somebody comes at the next meeting and goes, well, oh, no, it was this way it's because of this. The <laughs> fact of the matter is, from 1959 to 62, everybody's motorcycle sales skyrocketed. Harley's, I think, from what I read, went up 250%. And everybody's followed because of this advertising program and because Honda made... Honda put a renaissance on the motorcycling sport. It made it socially acceptable, and it brought everybody up by the bootstraps. So one might say if it wasn't for Honda, there might, might, might not be a few makes even around today, and the ones that were there in existence probably wouldn't have been there that long either because of what Honda did. <coughs> and little tie-ins, let's think 50 years later. Ross is mentioning, where's our new members? Where's the interest? Well, I've been starting to sell some stuff online, some Honda parts that we bought, myself and my partner bought recently. And I'm starting to talk to kids, I'm talking to guys who are in their 20s, who are starting to pull these things out of the garages. And they're coming to me saying, you've got these parts, what do you know about these bikes? And I say, well, listen, this is where you got to go on last Tuesday of the month. This is where you got to come. And it's possible that Honda, 50 years after they had created that renaissance, Maybe now they're going to create another renaissance in the fact that maybe there's our new members. There's our new interest in this hobby. It might be Asian bikes. Because let's face it, the barn find Nortons, the barn find Harleys, the barn find Indians, sorry, they're drying up. It's just not there anymore. So if you want to get into it and you want to restore something, really, what's next? What's coming? So let's just kind of hope that that's maybe the way things go. And uh, that's what I'll have to say about that little bike, and uh, you'll see it again this year. Unless I get the little uh, Yamaha going. Nice. Yeah, so that, that could be fun too. But anyway, uh, thanks very much for your time. Well done. And, uh, yeah, thank you.